Let's pray. Father, we thank you because you are challenging us and reminding us that there is a time when you will look at the fruit of our service. And at such a time, it will be wonderful if none of us will be empty-handed. You have chosen us, you have sent us, you have given us something to do so that we can bear fruit and so that our fruit will remain. And we are praying that all things that hinder fruit bearing, you will take away from our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. And as you are leading us and teaching us on how to bear fruit, we pray that you will be obedient to your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Open our hearts now to your word. Amen. Interpret your word to our hearts. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning we are looking at the word of God on leadership qualities in spirit-filled men and women. When you really think about the responsibilities and the functions of leadership, it strikes you very seriously that we need the spirit of the Lord to make us effective fruit-bearing leaders and yet many people have not seriously looked at how spirit-filled men or women ought to manifest the qualities of the spirit of the spirit in their lives so that they can fully and properly lead other people in the things of the lord we want to understand that when we are born again, the essential thing in our lives is that we have been given of the Spirit of God. In John chapter 3, where Jesus emphasized being born again, he said in verse 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Verse 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Verse 8, the wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. And so from the emphasis of Jesus Christ on the new birth, we know that when someone is born of the Spirit, the Spirit of God has done some work in that heart. One, before you were born again, you were convicted of your sin by the Spirit of God. You were reproved of your evil doings by the Spirit of God. You are called and led into praying by the Spirit of God. Now, you know, the Bible says that even when we have become Christians, we do not know how to pray or what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit helps our infirmities so that we'll be able to pray. And he is the one that leads us to know how to pray. And as sinners, we did not know how to pray. It was by the help of the Spirit of God that we knew how to pray. And after the prayer, it was the Spirit of God that came to bear witness with our hearts that were the children of God. That's why you have heard it often, as we have said, that those who are born of God, born again, they have a measure of the Spirit of God in their hearts, in their lives. In Romans chapter 8, verse 9, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not, the Spirit of Christ is none of his. That is, if we do not have any measure at all of the Spirit of God in our lives, then we do not have Christ. We do not belong to Christ. But the evidence that we belong to Christ is that we have some measure of the Spirit of God. In verse 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. 
the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. From all these passages of Scripture, you see it very clearly manifested that children of God have the Spirit of God. Those who are born of God are also born of the Spirit. And such people are led of the Spirit. They are controlled by the Spirit. And they are led to pray so that they can have more of the Spirit of God upon their lives. And that leads us to being sanctified. And after we are sanctified, we still go on until we are filled and baptized and totally controlled and influenced by the Spirit of God. But sometimes leaders in the household of faith will yield to methods of the flesh that is methods of men rather than of the spirit of god and here is where each leader needs to take inventory check up his own life and find out how he has been leading how he has been conducting his service in the house of god whether we have allowed the Spirit of God in us to lead through us and to function in our leadership functions. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now this tells us of the possibility that a person that is born again may choose to walk in the spirit or he may choose to fulfill the lust of the flesh he may choose to do everything that he does as he's led of the spirit of god or if he's careless and he doesn't take note in his own life he may be leading like ordinary men when it says of the flesh you know jesus said he that is born of the flesh is flesh that is still natural is acting like men in verse 17, for the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary, the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. Here the Lord is telling us that walking by the spirit will take some deliberate effort on your part. That if you just say well i have the spirit of god within me and i will allow him to just lead without any effort without any consecration without any deliberate plan he says but the flesh is working against the spirit that is if you do not deliberately manifest the spirit-led qualities or characteristics in your life the flesh the mind the natural will take over because they are contrary to the other so that if you are not making any effort you will not be doing the things that you would in verse 25 if ye live in the spirit let us walk if we live in the spirit let us walk in the spirit let us not be desirous of vain glory provoking one another envying one another and so here the lord is telling us that we'll need to do some things deliberately so that we will yield deliberately to the spirit of god leadership that is not spirit-led will be controlled by the flesh and any leadership that is controlled by the flesh that's in our methods in the way we lead in the way we act will not be pleasing to god the result is that what we do will not be a service unto the Lord if it's of the flesh, if it's through the carnal mind, if it is through natural qualities and tendencies, it will not please God, it will not receive any reward from God, it will not be blessed by God, the result will be failure. Romans chapter 8 again, verse 8. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. When you look at that verse, you sometimes think of the works of the flesh, like immorality, like all the other things that the people who are not born again, that they do. That's true. That the verse applies to that. 
but that's only a limited sense of the interpretation. It refers to everything that is done in the flesh without the help of the spirit. It refers to everything that is done in the natural strength, in the arm of the flesh, without the leading and the guidance and the inspiration of the Spirit of God. If you find out, for example, that you live your family life without the Spirit of God, every decision you take, in the way you relate together, in the way you act together between husband and wife, it is totally of the flesh. This verse applies. If you find that in your secular work, everything that you do, you do not allow the Spirit of God to have any say in the way you do things in your place of work. Everything that you do is totally carnal. It's totally of men. It has no influence of the Spirit of God. This verse applies. If, for example, you are preaching and you are given opportunity to address a congregation of people, if everything that you are giving out has nothing of the Spirit of God, is not led of the Spirit, is totally from your human mind, the verse applies. So then, they that are in the flesh, in all things that they do, in the family, in the places of work, between friend and friend, or in the leadership uh, role in the church, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. In verse 12, therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. Which means that the works that we're doing, they will produce death instead of life. If we're living, if we're acting, if we're functioning, if we're making use of carnal, human, natural methods in leadership. And we do not have the leadership of the Spirit and the control of the Spirit in our leadership. It says in verse 13, For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. You know that after we are born again, there will be temptation many, many times to still go to the works of the flesh. But you resist, you mortify, you destroy all those tendencies to the flesh. But you see, what we Christians have done is that we're very, very careful when it comes to a very serious temptation to, to immorality, to drinking again, to smoking again, to fighting and slapping your wife again. You're very, very careful because, you know, that one will be vulgar. It will be very, very bad. But then, when temptations come in other ways, that we should not live in the spirit, not function by the spirit, but we should function as ordinary, natural, carnal men. The way you talk to your wife, for example, when the temptation comes to you to behave like your old father, the way your father behaved with your own wife, bully on that wife, you don't know that's a very great temptation. That time you do not mortify the flesh, you just allow the flesh to go ahead and talk like that. And you say, I must bring that woman under control. Even the Bible says the man is the head of the home. It's a loving head, not a tyrannical head. But you see, many times we do not understand and we yield to the flesh in that area. Or it may be that two sisters are living together, two brothers are living together, and there's the temptation to behave carnally, to behave in the flesh. You know in the flesh how they do? Because other ladies live together and men live together who are not born again. But the way they react to themselves with suspicion, with envy, with reservation, with withdrawal, that's walking like men. And when in your own case you have temptation to act like that, withdraw yourself from that person even though you are living together, and be very careful of that person even though you are living together, and uh, be very restrictive even though you are living together, that time you do not mortify the flesh. You just allow that to continue. The only area that some people are mortifying the flesh is that they do not want to commit adultery. They do not want to do anything that is vulgar, that is very, very bad, outrightly bad and wicked. But in all these various areas, they do not mortify the flesh. The same thing in leadership. You see, there is leadership in the church, there is leadership in the world. Without leadership in the world, people cannot do the things they're doing. Look at all these bridges that they are, con they are, they are constructing. You need leadership for those workers 
so that they will be able to construct those bridges. You need leadership that will be very high. You need low leadership to the foreman and those things like that. In the bank, without some form of leadership, how can they do all the things that they are doing? So they have leadership to in the bank. You know at school, you've gone to school yourself. We have leadership. We have the prefects, we have the teachers, we have the headmaster, the principal. And these people are controlled in a particular way. In the army, we have leadership. Everywhere you go, you have leadership. Without that leadership and the leaders having the authority that they ought to have, nothing will move in the world. But understand that many of us, because we're also we're living in the world, we're working in the world, we're relating with the people in the world. And anywhere, you, even if you say, well, I'm an illiterate, I'm not working in the office, don't you see that in the market there are leaders and there are their unions? And in their unions, they have their leaders. Don't you see in the farmers' uh, corporation that they have uh, the leaders over those farmers? Any area you are, even villages, don't you have chiefs and leaders in the villages, in the clans, in the tribes? We have leaders. But you see, because we have been living with these people in the world, we know how the natural men and the natural women, how they manifest leadership qualities. But those people are not born again. And therefore, their leadership qualities are generally devoid of the Spirit of God. And when we are tempted to lead like them, when we are tempted to have a leadership roles and functions like the leaders in the world, that time we do not mortify the flesh. We just go ahead. Or we say that leadership style is effective when they are constructing the road. It's effective in our school system. It's effective in the army. So if they have those leadership qualities in the army, and the leadership qualities in the army is the one that stamps out the course and everything, then we can do that. No, we cannot do that. Their own success is limited success. And their success is filled with a lot of things that if you really examine them, everything will fall apart. Therefore, we as Christians who have the spirit of God, must mortify the deeds of the flesh, the actions and the functions of the natural men in our leadership if we're going to succeed and we're going to have a well done from the Lord. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, from verse 3, For ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envy and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? For while one says, I'm of Apollos, and another, I'm of, while one says, I'm of Paul, and another, I'm of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Here were Christians at Corinth, and these Christians, obviously, they knew the Lord. And you will see that even in this um, passage, where Paul the Apostle was correcting and rebuking, their carnality, telling them that they were not fully yielding to the spirit in their relationships and reactions together. He still accepted that they were Christians. Look at verse 1. And I, brethren, you can't use brothers and sisters for sinners. I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. They were born again. But he told them they were not yielding fully enough to the Spirit of God. And they had this division and envy among themselves. And they would say, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos. Well, don't you know if you examine the society, you find that that is very common among men. Think about marriage, for example. And you had messages on marriage, on marriage last night. In marriage, um, heads of families... Mothers, fathers will tell their people and their children that we are of, then they mention their tribe or their clan or their little community. Therefore, my daughter, my son, you must not go outside this local boundary to go and marry because we are of this. They are of that. And then from state to state is the same thing. That uh, people will say, even if you are going to go a little bit beyond this boundary, we are of this area. They are of that area. You cannot go beyond. That's what they do in the world. 
The same thing as you look at the various people that are working. You see a lot of discrimination among them. Now, primary school teachers never go along with secondary school teachers because they are not in the same class. They are teachers, they have the same profession, but they are not in the same class. And the secondary school teachers will look at the primary school teachers. They are of that section, lower grade. We are of this. And of course, university lecturers have nothing to do with secondary school teachers. Conferences don't bring them together. Training doesn't bring them together. Nothing brings them together. They are of this, and we are of that. And even when you get to the university, the assistant lecturers have nothing to do with the senior lecturers because the assistant lecturers, what do they know? They are just a little bit above the secondary school teachers. It's just that we need all these hands in the laboratory and, you know, to do the practical. That's why they are there. And what do the professors have to do with the senior lecturers? You see, that's what the, Paul the Apostle was saying, that in the societies of men, you have this class, this class, that class. And these people now, the Corinthians, they started the same thing in the church. And you might say, that was very, very bad. But how about you? That if a particular zona leader is talking, oh, you say, I'm not of that. In fact, I, I crossed over, I left that zone because of that man. And uh, what a pity now, they bring all of us together, uh, two districts, and I happen to fall into his class when we're going to have another study, maybe after this time. And, um, well, and very quietly, you move away and you say, since I moved away from him in that zone, I don't want him to have any influence on me. If he's the only one that can teach the way into heaven, well... Thank God it's not the only one. Thank God there are other people. And I will go and listen to other. I cannot listen to that man. I'm not of Apollos. I'm of Paul. Others, I'm not of Paul. I am of Severs. Others, I don't even take the authority of any man. Paul, Apollos, Severs, all I know is Christ. I've been born again by Jesus Christ. And what he tells me to do, I do. All the instruction, information they pass on to people, if it's coming from Apollos, it's a human being. Every human being has imperfection. And I don't follow imperfect people. If it's Paul, every human being has imperfection. I don't follow Paul. If it's Severs, every human being has imperfection. I don't follow Peter. But Jesus Christ, the sinless, the perfect one, he is the one I'm following. Well, that's easy for you because when you are going wrong, you say, well, it's Christ I'm following. If Paul talks to you and says, but uh, brother or sister, why don't you correct this? That's the way you see it. But I am listening to Christ. But you don't pray. How can a prayerless man listen to Christ? A person that is not baptized in the Holy Ghost is listening. He says, Christ is the one that is listening to a person that if you told him to, okay, open Ezekiel and read and uh, interpret chapter 1 for us. He reads and uh, he says, ah, all these wheels and flying and all that. What does this mean? I don't understand. How about Christ is your leader now and Paul can't explain to you. Apollos cannot explain to you. And Sebas cannot explain to you. Why doesn't that Christ explain everything to you? And if we study Exodus chapter uh, 31 to 40, you know, all those um, instruments and the tables and the gold and the silver and the sheeting wood and, you know, the cherubims and everything. And we say now, since uh, you are not, you cannot accept teaching from Apollos or Paul or Severs, now learn it yourself. And you read through everything and you say, why did they write all this in the Bible? I don't understand this. How about Christ? Christ is the only one you are following. Since Christ is the only one you are following, why doesn't he teach you? He has given you leaders. He said some in the church. First, apostle. Secondly, prophets. Then, teachers. And then, after that, he, gets us, he gives us a list of other leaders. But you see, the Corinthian church, they are divided into little, little bits. I am of this. I am of that. I am not there. I'm only here. And Paul the Apostle told them they were walking as men. They were not yielding to the Spirit anymore. And so in our own leadership too, in the zones, in the area, and in the house fellowship, there are times that though you are born again, there's no doubt about that. If you have given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, yet you are not yielding fully to the Spirit of God. 
Now, what do we learn of the qualities of those leaders that are spirit-filled, spirit-controlled, spirit-directed? The greatest example we have is the example of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's look at chapter 3 of John. John chapter 3, verse 34. For he whom God has, whom God has sent speaketh the words of God. For God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. That means the Lord has given the Spirit without measure unto him. And he is the one that was always led of the Spirit, influenced of the Spirit, directed of the Spirit. He said, I do nothing of myself. As the Father has taught me, even so do I these things. And he did everything that pleased the Father every time. How did he do it? By the leading of the Spirit of God. By the leading of the Spirit of God. And in Luke chapter 22, from verse 25, And he said unto them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. And they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors, but ye shall not be so. Here the Lord told them that there is leadership in the world, just like I've been telling you. And that these leaders in the world, they have a style of leadership. And it says, it shall not be so among you. Now you see, the difficulties we have is that some of us have been leaders in the world and now we're leaders in the church or some of us are still to the present day leaders in the world as well as leaders in the church and there is the acceptable leadership quality or leadership style in the world and when you're in the world let's say you are working in the bank let's say you are teaching in a school let's say you are working with a construction company and these people, you cannot appeal to them through scripture. You cannot, uh, while you are working in the bank, for example, you want uh, a typist or want a cashier to do something or to give you a report, you cannot go to John and make a quotation to that person and say, because of this verse, hurry up and give me that assignment tomorrow. That will be strange to them. Over there, in the secular employment, they don't apply the Bible like that. Neither do they apply prayer. If you have a problem in the place of work, for example, you cannot tell the man and say, look at this problem that you have. Now, the way to solve this problem is that you should go to the Lord in prayer. Now, they don't solve construction problem that way. They'll go back to their drawing board and they will find out about the strain and the stress and the quantity um, survey that they have done and, every, and see why that thing is failing. Not that they will go and be praying. Whereas when you come to the church, if you have been a leader in the world, and now you are a leader in the church. If you are not careful, the same thing you are doing over there in the world is the same thing you will be doing in the church. And you will say that leadership is not strange to me. I'm a leader over there in the world. And if I get all those people controlled, and I get them directed, and I do everything that ought to be done, why can't I do it here? A person may succeed over there in building roads, or in teaching in the school, or being a principal of a school, and come over here in the church and be a total failure. Because the methods are different. The functions are different. The way that we're leaders or we apply our leadership qualities in the church, they're very, very different. That's what Jesus said. Jesus said, this is how they do it in the world, but ye shall not be so. And he that is greatest among you, let him be as a younger. He that is cheap, as he that serves, that does serve. For whether he is greater, he that sitteth at meat, or he that serveth, it's not he that sitteth at meat, but I am among you as he that serveth. Christ has given us the example. And you know, his own example is the example of perfect, spirit-led, spirit-controlled, spirit-guided leadership. Let's come back to John. John chapter 13, verse 15. For I have given you an example that you should do as I've done unto you. I have given you an example that you should do as I have done unto you. 
The purpose of the Lord is that every leader will be like him. That what every leader does in the church, he will do it like Christ would have done it. What every preacher preaches, that he would preach it as Christ would have preached. And that as we lead and guide other people, we will lead and guide like Jesus would have done it. That's what Jesus was impressing upon the disciples before he left. And he said, I have given you an example. In a limited sense, he had given an example in John chapter 13. In a broad sense, he has given an example in the whole of the Gospels. In the broadest sense, he has given us an example of the totality of his life, everything he ever did. Not only in John chapter 13, everything that he ever did from the time he emerged, he came to the public and he started leading those people. He did everything as an example for us who are leading under his authority. Because he said he has chosen us. We have not chosen ourselves. He has chosen us and he has placed us in the places of responsibility so that we can bear fruit. How then shall we lead? What do we learn from Christ? Because we know that he was spirit-filled. We learn a lot, a lot of things from the leadership style of Jesus Christ. In John chapter 10, verse 7, Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. Jesus was a door. The door, not a barrier one of the things we should check up in our own leadership style is am i a barrier to people who want to get saved am i a barrier to people who want to know the lord am i a barrier to those who want to see the good things in the church and come to the church am i a barrier to those who are seeking god am i hindering them because in leadership if you follow the leadership of the lord jesus christ you'll be a door and not a barrier and you think of the way you lead your house fellowship. Are you hindering someone there from growing spiritually? Are you a barrier to the progress, spiritual progress of those people? Are you hindering them and closing the door before them so that they cannot get saved? Your life, your example, your utterances, the things that you do, your dressing. Are you such a barrier that they cannot follow the standard of the Bible? Or are you an open door that your life leads them through to come into the kingdom of God? Your life makes them to want to get into the depth and the center of the will of God. Do they so see the will of God in your life that you become a door for them and through your life they are able to enter into the will of God? When you are spirit filled, your leadership style, everything you do will make you a door, not a a barrier chapter 10 verse 11 i am the good shepherd the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep what we learn from the leadership style of jesus is that he was always sacrificing rather than demanding his right now if you see the leadership in the world those who are leading by the carnal natural methods they're always demanding their rights they demand their rights from the company. They demand their rights from their superior. Or they said, yes, I'm subordinate, but I know my right. They demand their rights from their equals. And of course, they seriously, aggressively demand their rights from the subordinate. But you see, Jesus Christ in his leadership, he said, I am the good shepherd. A shepherd is a leader. A shepherd is the one that goes before the sheep so that the sheep can follow and in his shepherding or leadership life, he has shown us that we must be giving even our very life for the sheep. That is your sacrifice without demanding your rights. In the house fellowship as you lead, do you lead like that? That you're always sacrificing and you're not always claiming your right, standing on your right, saying I know what belongs to me. Even though I'm a house fellowship leader, area leader, I'm not going to allow that because I don't want to sacrifice too much. But Jesus sacrificed the greatest 
thing he could sacrifice. He is very life. And so we learn that if we're going to be led, or if we're going to lead other people, like Jesus wants us to lead, you'll sacrifice and you will not be demanding your rights. Verse 11 and verse 12 together. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd, who soon the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth. And the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. Now, the leader is a shepherd, not a hireling. The hireling is the one that is doing it for the pay, for the commendation, for the praise. If you are praising him and he's getting the praise every week, that he get the salary every week, or if he's getting his pay every day, like the casual workers get their pay every day, if you are giving him commendation, always praising him, always encouraging him, always telling him, oh, you are doing well. We appreciate your work. We know that the thing you are doing is very great. We need you in this place. You are the one that is working fastest of the people. And your work is very fantastic, very, very encouraging. You are very good. You are very nice. Once you are giving him his salary like that, every day he will keep on working. That's a higher name. But the moment you don't pay the salary, you don't give him the salary like that, the praise of men like that, the commendation like that, at the end of a particular week, he cannot work anymore. Why are you not working? They have not paid me. The one I did last week, nobody said thank you. Nobody said well done. Nobody said you are doing fine. Nobody said you are, you are trying. Nobody said, oh, we can't do without you in this place and I'm waiting for my salary. I'm waiting for my pay. When they pay me for the one I did last week, then I will do the work I ought to do this week. That's the hireling. But the one that is not a hireling, but a shepherd, is not waiting for a thank you. How many times do the sheep say thank you to the shepherd? He gets them to where they drink water. He gets them to where they uh, have the grass gets them to the shelter. Do those sheep, while the shepherd is uh, bringing them or taking them to the shelter, do they kneel down before the shepherd and, uh, you know, begin to demonstrate that you're doing so well? No, when he doesn't do well, they cry. When he does well, they are quiet. And the shepherd goes on taking care of the sheep. And Jesus said, that's what he has been doing. That as a shepherd, he is giving his life for the sheep. To give life means to give time. To give life means to give property. To give life means that you'll give everything that is important. Give up your luxury. Give up your convenience so that you can sacrificially give or minister to the needs of the people. Shepherd, not hireling. Look at verse 16. Another sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. A real leader is visionary and evangelistic, not contented with few. You see, there are leaders that will say, those people in the house fellowship, they are in all. They are telling us to go out and bring in more, more people. The people that we have inside, we have not really caring for them. And so, we must remain with these few people. Even these uh, seven people in my house fellowship, the trouble they give me, <laughs> they have almost killed me. So, if I go out and bring, and they become ten, I don't think I can manage that. These seven people, they are enough. Those who want to be just bringing them, bringing them in, let them go and be doing that. As for me, these seven people, I will say to them, they are enough for me. I'm not looking for anybody to make me a real leader. They say, if your house fellowship is growing and they break it this time and break it that time, then maybe one day you can become a real leader. I don't want a real leader. I cannot manage an area. These seven people, they are enough for me. That's not a leader. A leader is visionary. A leader is evangelistic. Other sheep I have, not yet in this fold, them I must bring. That's what we learned from the Lord Jesus Christ, that he was always reaching out. Always reaching out. And at the end, when he was going away, he said, go ye into all the world. Preach the gospel to every creature. You can see the mind of the master. You can see his vision. You can see his evangelistic zeal. 
And so, if we too are following the spirit-guided and spirit-controlled leadership of Jesus Christ, you'll be visionary like that. You will not be stagnant. You will not just be at the same place. You'll be bringing in more people every time. And then in John chapter 8, sorry, chapter 10, verse 18, there is voluntary service, not forced service. A person that is a real leader voluntarily gives himself, voluntarily offers himself. Not that we're coercing and we're forcing the person, and you have to be pulling him and dragging him and telling him, you must do this work, you must do this work, your house fellowship is not growing, your area is not growing. Since you became a zona leader, no increase at all. What are you doing? Well, I have no time. And the people too, you know, the transport difficulty is there. Some of them don't have accommodation. Some of them have family problem. And when you go to them, you read Bible. They say they don't want Bible now because they are jobless. Many of them have been retrenched. To be a zona leader is not easy. We push them, we drag them. They say they will not drag. And even I myself, coordinator, if I told you the problems I have, you will pity me. I need even somebody to be caring for me than me caring for people in the zone. And uh, we have to encourage the fellow and say, hey, be praying. Hey, I've been praying, but there is no answer. And since I prayed, 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 and prayed, and there is no answer, uh, I'm even wondering whether I should not be a woman rep, whether I should not be a zona leader, whether I should not be an area leader, whether I should not be leading um, a, a house at all. Maybe I should just, you know, stay away from all those students and just take care of myself because uh, this, the body is too great. I cannot bear it. I'm, I'm already, uh, the thing is crushing me. And you have to force him and drag him. And, uh, well, and they say, well, in any case, come for Saturday meeting. Well, I wasn't thinking I would go before because uh, when we go there now, the pastor will be saying, those whose house fellowships are not growing, your house fellowship must grow. He doesn't know the trouble we have. We, and I've been even trying to see that pastor now for three months and I've not seen him myself. But you know, it's voluntary service. I laid down myself. It wasn't easy for Jesus, but he laid down his life. Laid down his life. Not that somebody was forcing him. Everybody was even discouraging him. His disciples discouraged him that he will not go to the cross and die. The Pharisees and the Sadducees were discouraging him. And the people of the land, all of them, they were discouraging him. And yet, with all the discouragement, he said voluntarily, I lay down my life myself. Nobody is taking it away from me. John chapter 10 verse 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. You know sometimes you need to contact somebody in the zone and you call the zona leader and uh, you say uh, we, are, we need the attention of so and so in your zone and uh, the zona leader will say is that person in my zone? I never had a name like that before. He's living in such and such a place. He gave us information. He's attending a particular fellowship like this. Ah, <laughs> That uh, place, it's a remote area of our zone. I've not been there now for the past one year. I don't know them, they don't know me. And uh, I've uh, told the area leader there, they never come for general meeting. And uh, since I asked them, come for general meeting, come for zonal meeting, and come to the church, and they have not been coming, I just left them in the hand of God. I don't, uh, I don't bother myself. I, anything that is too difficult, once I tell them, Area leaders, as fellowship leaders, this is what to do. If they don't do it, I leave them in the hands of God. And so that area, I left it in the hands of God. So that person you're asking of, I don't know him. And then somebody uh, has a problem. Uh, somebody has died. And uh, we need to get at his relatives. And we say, his relative is even a member of your zone. But he's not living in the same uh, area. He's living in this other place. Uh, which area is that? Where is particular? Yes, I know the place. I've been there. I was there in February, and this is December. And um, the house fellowship he attends. Oh, the house fellowship there. Those people, the day I went there, I said, good evening. They couldn't even say good evening. Not to even say good evening, sir. They were just looking at me like this. Since that time, the people that have no love, no respect, no acceptance for zonal leader, I didn't go there again. Uh, so I lost contact with that man you're asking for now. 
how do we get the man now well i'm even ashamed to go to that place because i've led them for a long long time that's not leadership but a leader he said my sheep know my voice no, when they hear my voice they know it and they follow me and i know them and an area leader an area leader that just has a few people and yet you do not know those few people even house fellowship leader can you imagine house fellowship leader with 10 people under him under her and uh, they said somebody is uh, having uh, trouble and he said who will take me to a house i've never visited a house before 10 people for one year he has she has never visited a house before and uh, they don't know her and she doesn't know them they said um, sister uh, so and so is having problem in her husband's house and uh, it's in your house she's in your house worship therefore go there immediately who is that sister so and so Josephine Josephine whenever she comes to the house worship where does she sit in this corner or in that corner or at the back well she doesn't sit in the same place every time uh, Josephine, which one will I go now? And then uh, the one that you know, you go to the house. Ah, Sister Josephine, how are you? Jo I'm not Josephine. I'm Janet. Oh, you are Janet. They said that there's one Josephine in our house fellowship that is having trouble. Ah, Sister Josephine, I don't know her clearly myself, but maybe it's, you know, when you take that corner and go there is uh, a house over there maybe that is a sister and then uh, you go there and say ah how are you good evening sister Josephine I've been looking for you no I'm not Josephine I'm Mary where is Josephine now but it's in your house fellowship and then in the following house fellowship uh, you say who is uh, Josephine and uh, somebody living near said that she has packed that and gone to her stage because uh, she said she was uh, in such a great trouble that even zonal, uh, even um, house leader she didn't see house leader how, how would she see zonal leader how would she see area leader so you know Josephine yes I know her she lives oh I oh is that a woman that uh, is uh, plumpy like this uh-huh that woman that used to sit when the child was making trouble uh, three weeks ago the one you were saying if you don't want to come to us for she go away that one now you're not just pain <laughs> but you, you didn't know before how can we be in house fellowship and we don't know the few people that are there in the area we do not know the few people that are there and in the zone we do not know the people that are there jesus said i know my sheep look at how many the church is what if eventually you get to heaven and um, you said i want to enter they say who are you you say i'm saved i'm a child of god I, i've been following christ and they call christ they said this person said he has been following you identify him identify her and jesus said i never knew him I've never seen him. Ah, you said you, you are the one that gave me salvation. Now I confess my sins. And then you mentioned the date. Okay, do you, you are born again. Yes, and I made restitution. I did this and that. Well, uh, the church is too large. I don't know you. But if you say you are saved, come in. Enter into heaven. What will that heaven look like? But you see, Jesus has given us the style of leadership. And you should know the sheep. You should care for the sheep. And you should be able to touch their lives in your own leadership. I know my sheep hear my voice and I know them. And they follow me. There is, should be an attitude of friendliness, fellowship, and love to the followers. That's what Jesus had to them. Let's look at John chapter 11. Verse 33. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled and said, Where have you laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Then said the Jews, Behold, how he loved him. Leadership should be compassionate and sympathetic. Not somebody that has grown thick skin to the problems of people. They say, somebody's child has died, the leader has no feeling. Somebody has lost his job, the leader has no feeling. Brother so-and-so's wife has packed out, the leader has no feeling. Uh, somebody is very sick now, they rushed him to the hospital, the leader has no feeling. 
And sister so and so just lost her mother, and sister so and so is undergoing terrible grief. The, uh, the leader has no feeling. They said now that they are retrenching people uh, in that uh, place of work. And uh, this person said, uh, pray for me in time so that my name will not be included among the people that they would, um, they would send out of that place. The leader has no sympathy. His own is attend house fellowship, attend Monday Bible study, attend Thursday meeting, attend Sunday meeting. And if you are a worker, come to the workers meeting. And once uh, they said, this fellow has not been coming to a workers meeting, uh, well... You are a house fellowship leader and your area leader. You are not coming to a workers' meeting. I give you one more chance. Co begin to come now. Anytime I hear you are not coming to the workers' meeting again, that's final. Well, uh, brother, I understand what you are saying. But I wanted to tell you, the reason is that, you see, when that rain came and the flood was terrible and the flood was getting into my room, uh, that's why I was packing my thing. What I said is that do not miss workers' meeting. Next time you miss workers' meeting, it will be trouble. I will stop you completely. Well, you see, it was because they came to report to me from our village that my mother is sick. And they wanted me to come immediately. And I was even go I had to go to some people to give me money. And what a shame that I was. I didn't want to go to the uh, house fellowship members. And I needed to go to one uncle somewhere and get money so that I can travel home because my mother is about dying. And I'm the only one that is left for my mother. I don't want to hear anything. But what I want to know from you is that the workers meeting you will never miss it that's what i'm discussing mother is sick that is not strange there are women that are sick in the hospital too everybody is sick you are talking about your mother is sick whose mother is not sick my own mother is sick too therefore what i'm saying is that come to workers meeting you hear and uh, in fact zona leader or area i've been trying to see you myself uh, this workers meeting by the grace of God I will be coming but I need help and I need prayer from you uh, because even to go to church on Sunday the transportation is very difficult for me and uh, who will I tell I cannot tell if we're in the bus and they are asking for everybody to contribute money and I'm a house fellowship leader and the members are giving the money for their transportation and I just uh, put my hand in an empty pocket sometimes it is that shame that is stopping me Anyway, I didn't come for counseling now. I didn't come for loaning or giving money now. What I came for is they accused you of not coming to a workers' meeting regularly on Saturday. That's what I heard. That's what I came to solve. As for money, transportation, and all that, that one, are you not a child of God? Go and pray on that one. What I want to know is that workers' meeting, as a leader, the same point I came for is what I must emphasize to you. Workers' meeting, if you miss it again, you will know that I'm your leader. But Jesus Christ wept. And he said, see how he loved him. That's the example Jesus has given us. Of leadership. Compassionate, sympathetic. And then in John chapter 13, verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own, which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. Constant love, though in personal problem. There are people that carry their personal problems on their faces. And that makes them to be bad leaders. Once they have any problem in their place of work, they cannot uh, lead people aright. They are sensitive, they are touchy, they are irritated. And there are leaders, house fellowship leaders, sisters, or area leaders, sisters, or women rest perhaps. Whenever they have family problem, and the husband uh, said, today there is no money for food. Oh. See how you will take care of your children. When there is no money, your children. And see how you will do this and do that. And then we are to have the women meeting in the zone. And it happened that in the afternoon was when the husband said, feeding the children, looking at this and looking at that, see how you will do that. And do you know that my mother is coming uh, tomorrow? And you must see how you will feed her. Because now there is no money in my pocket. 
and you know the trouble you have with my mother already that anytime she comes here you don't take care of her properly and they are now mentioning your name in the village if she comes tomorrow again and you say because you've not got money well you will between me between you and my mother look into that but i just told you now my mother is coming tomorrow take care of her when she comes and with all that trouble you have to go and lead the women in the zone and because you are inside personal problem yourself <laughs> You, when you get there, the loudspeaker has not been set. The people that you put light there, they have not put it there. And those men that they give you to help you put light and put this one, you go to them, you are reacting to them like your husband. The anger you wanted to manifest to your husband at home, and you didn't because you know that he will slap you if you do that. Uh, the anger you should have uh, manifested to your husband at home that you couldn't manifest. All those other area leaders and people, the brothers that are fixing the light, how ah, you see, what type of useless brothers are you? <laughs> that uh, look, now we want to have our women fellowship. The light is not there. Our loudspeaker system is not there. Everything is not there. You don't want us to. We know you men, you, don't have, you are not happy that we women are having opportunity in the church. We know you are not happy. Uh, we know your heart. But whether you like it or not, we are going to have our fellowship. Oh, they say something is wrong today with our sister. <laughs> but you see, when people, some people have personal problems, that's how they behave. But look at Jesus Christ. He was going to the cross. He knew the time has come for him to depart out of the world. And yet, having loved his own, he loved them unto the end. Constant love, though you are in personal problem. In verses 4 and 5, John 13, verses 4 and 5, he rised from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and guarded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was guarded that his servanthood exhibited, not lordship manifested. Servanthood, the ability to serve, and stoop down and wash the feet, the dirty feet of the people. John chapter 14, verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. Jesus always had words of encouragement in troublous times. A leader will have words of encouragement in troublous times. When people have problems, those who are led by the Spirit, guided by the Spirit, they will always have for you words of encouragement a brother in the zone is trying to get married and uh, you ask him now you've been in country for two years three years and uh, you are not married yet what's the problem with you and i uh, said well it has been a point of prayer that i've been trying to gather money to even pay the dowry and i've not been able to succeed or i paid the dowry already but i'm waiting so that I can have enough uh, to buy various things in the home. Ah, Why did you behave foolishly like that? You went to pay dowry. No chair at home, nothing to cook. It's your foolishness. And normally you, you will suffer for your foolishness. I didn't know that's the problem. So you first of all pay dowry. Didn't you use your common sense? And know that you should have equipped your house, done this and done that. Then you know you are ready for my. You go to pay dowry. I didn't know that's the problem. In any way, we'll be praying for you. That man will not believe you will be praying for him. Because that attitude is not the attitude of an intercessor. Attitude of somebody that is praying. Words of encouragement. Words of encouragement. Somebody has family problem. And um, he's saying, I don't know if I can continue leading an area. Because my wife always makes life uncomfortable for me. And I don't like to nag and get angry and do this and that. And even though I, I prayed and I controlled myself, but still I'm not happy with myself, the way I talked to her yesterday and the way I talked to her the other day. And then let me go and report myself to the zonal leader or to the area leader and uh, said, I think uh, I want to have some time to pray. Why? What's the problem? Well, uh, my wife and myself, not that we fought, but the way we spoke to one another, I was sharp with my wife. And I, I felt guilt. Ah, so, uh, you have started your fighting again? Okay. Uh, which area are you leading? I'm leading such and such an area. Okay. 
as you have come it is good i will deal with that later but let me care for the work of god first go aside because uh, you, we have tried to correct you we have tried to help you you will help will never help will never succeed with you uh, brother this man has been fighting with his wife he told me that they just spoke sharp words but i don't know how much they did because i have not investigated but before i investigate go and take up his area go and lead the area People that say they are saved, they are sanctified, always quieting, the no time for them. Get out of the, of the work. Let another person do it. God has a lot of, you think you are special, look at them. Many people at Bagada, we can easily make them area leader. So brother, help us. Go and, go and lead that area. Hey brother, I, I was, we didn't fight. What is fighting? When somebody begins to talk sharply to the other fellow, fighting has started now. Oh, you are waiting for when you take cutlass and cut ahead. <laughs> Before you know that you are fighting, you have been fighting already. No words of encouragement. A person that felt like a failure at home and is looking for who will comfort me, who will help me to help my wife. When the person came there, the, what the person was not expecting is what the person will meet. But Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. A leader that will encourage words of sympathy words of love words of encouragement and say well brother you know marriage is like a school and you will find out that in marriage sometimes your wife will do things that you don't like just say uh, you know cool down do not speak any sharp word after all she is the mother of your children and all those things will not help uh, i will see her myself and then tell her to come and see me. But as you are saying, you don't want to lead us fellowship or want to be an area. Everybody has problem. If we think of, uh, you know, I spoke to that one. They didn't pay my salary. I was a little bit uh, rough with the cashier in the office. If we say because of that, nobody we will not work for God. Nobody will work for God. Go back to your work. We'll settle that. And uh, God will help you. We are praying for you. That man will go back with encouragement. Then we call the wife and say, ah. Don't you know that as, you are, as your husband is working for God, if your husband is successful, God will reward you for making him successful. And if you make life difficult for your husband, don't you know that you are leading together? Even though you may say, well, I'm not house fellowship leader, I'm not area leader, it's only my husband that is working for God. As you are making life easy for your husband, God will give you a reward. And hey, sister, what is the problem? Uh, that man is just a hypocrite he's only leading uh, people he only knows bible he doesn't know how to apply it in his life yes but what is the problem well uh, you know yesterday morning he was going out and i said uh, uh, papa bc uh, make sure that uh, you leave uh, five naira down and the man so he reads bible oh, he just finished quiet time and said i have no five naira go and take care of yourself and i became angry okay i understand you know, it's natural to feel like that. But don't yield to the natural. God will provide for you. Any other problem in the family? Well, it is only this and this and this. Why not go back to your husband and say you are sorry? No, I will never say I'm sorry to that man. If you say you are sorry to that man, the following day, he will say, you have started again. You know, you'll come back and you'll say you are sorry later. So to say you are sorry to that man is dangerous. No, don't act like that, sister. Go back to him and say, I'm sorry. And whatever the problem is, we are praying for you. And uh, don't think that your husband is a, you know, is a great sinner. He's a child of God. You must even be happy that you have a man like that. That God has allowed you to marry a man like that. Uh, you must be thanking God. If you know what is happening in other families, you will go and kneel down and be saying, God, I thank you for giving me this man. Uh, is that so? I thought my husband is, uh, you know, the most terrible person in the whole zone. Ah, you are making a great mistake. That's your husband. Even myself, that I'm a man, I'm thanking God for your husband. Is that so? The woman will run home and say, ah, my husband, I didn't know you were good like that. <laughs> I thought that uh, you are, you know, you are just a sinner and a criminal. Okay, my husband, uh, uh, don't be angry. What do you want to eat now? You see, words of encouragement. That will help. Help our leaders. Help the people that are having problems. Words of encouragement in troublous times. That's what leaders should give out. But look at John chapter 14. Verses 8 and 9. Philip says unto him, Lord, show us the Father. And it suffices us. Jesus says unto him, Have I been so long time with you? And yet hast thou not known me, Philip? 
He that has seen me has seen the Father. And how sayest thou, show us the Father? That is gentle rebuke for offenders. Gentle rebuke. Philip said something that Jesus was not expecting. It showed that he had not been paying enough attention. He has not known Jesus Christ the way he ought to know him. And Jesus just said, have I been with you for a long time? Haven't you been in the church for a long time? Brother, you should know that. Haven't you been a worker for a long time? Sister, you should know that if you are traveling out, you should have reported to the zonal leader so that we'll be able to know how to replace you. But now you just traveled without telling anybody. That's not right. Have you not been here for a long time? Gentle rebuke. Telling them in such a way that they will easily correct themselves. John chapter 17 verse 9. I pray for them. I pray not for the world. But for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine, you intercede for them, for the leaders under you, so that you can supply their need and strength when you are absent. Jesus was going to be absent from them, and he knew that they will not be able to carry all the burden. Because of that, he was praying for them. And we as leaders should pray for those under us, so that they will have the grace the strength, all that they need when we are absent from them. John chapter 19, from verse 1. But Pilate therefore took Jesus and scorched him. And the soldiers plated a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put him, they put on him a purple robe. And said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they smote him with their hands. Pilate therefore went forth again and saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that ye may know that I find no fault in him. Verse 6. And the chief priests therefore and officers saw him. When they saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. He lived an exemplary life in the midst of suffering. They plated a crown of thorns. They spat on him. They smote him. They did all things to him that will make a person to even get angry and fight back. But in the midst of it all, Pilate could not find any fault. All that they accused him of before, he had been guiltless. And what had been happening to him, while Pilate had the opportunity of seeing him, he had also been guiltless. A leader must be blameless and live an exemplary life, even in the midst of suffering. And let me ask you, when you are going through rebuke, misunderstanding, and many people are saying, crucify him, crucify him. And you know that you are not like that. They shouldn't have been saying that. You had helped them, counseled them, taught them, healed them, delivered them. And yet they are saying all that they are saying. Do you remain faultless, blameless, honest, and holy? And still having an exemplary life? When you have a problem in your own family, and everything is against you. As a leader, do you still keep up an exemplary life? That the people that examine you, the people that see you, and they watch your behavior, even in the midst of that suffering, they can say, I find no fault in him. These are the examples that Jesus has left for us. One that we should be doors and not barrier. That we should sacrifice and not always demanding our rights. We should be like shepherds, not hirelings. We should give voluntary service, not forced service. We should be uh, visionary and evangelistic. We should not be satisfied or contented with the few. And we should be friendly, have people in fellowship, and let us love the people that are under our control or under our leadership. We should be compassionate and sympathetic. Constantly loving, even though you might be in personal problem. Manifest, exhibit servanthood, not lordship. Always have a word of encouragement to people in trouble. 
and give gentle rebuke to offenders whenever you have to correct. Intercede for people, pray for them, to supply their need and the strength that they need when you are absent. Let there not be any retaliation or retaliatory spirit coming out of you. Of you. Just correct the people, but do it in love, and keep on leading an exemplary life, even when things are not going on right for you. Let's rise up and pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we are very grateful unto you for the way you have spoken to us this morning again. Lord, we thank you because you just don't want us to continue to labor without our labor being acceptable in thy sight. Lord, we've discovered that many a times we are led by the flesh. And when we do things like that, not profitable unto us, not profitable unto the people we are leading, and even not acceptable in thy sight, it wearies our souls. And our Lord, we just thank you that this morning you have set the Lord before us, a true example. Lord, truly, before we even came to know the Lord, we have been looking to the world, and we see leadership roles and styles in the world. And Lord, because we have long been in the world, we come into the kingdom and we want to also manifest this leadership styles. This has badly affected us. But our God and our Father, we thank you that at a time like this, you have called us aside to set the Lord before us, that the Lord may always be before us. We thank you for this great example. Our joy is that, dear Lord, you are not here to tantalize us. You have shown us the best thing that is befitting unto the ministry you have given unto us. And dear Lord, all you want us is, as you have shown us these qualities in our Savior, in our Lord, in our King, in Him. Lord, we pray, we ask you that all these qualities, you will wrought it unto our soul in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We are told that he was given a spirit in no little measure. Our God and our Father. When Jesus will have this spirit in such a great measure, we are here, Almighty God, member of his body. Lord, we pray you will really fill us with the Holy Spirit in no little measure in Jesus' name. Amen. Our God and our Father, we also discover that he speaks gently with his people. The people hear the voice. The sheep hear the voice. Is always leading and leading in the path of righteousness from time to time. I will pray, dear Father, that in like manner, the people we are leading as house fellowship leaders, as area leaders, as zona leaders, as uh, children workers, even as coordinators, we pray, we ask our God that all that is necessary and needed to lead them in such a way that, dear Father, they receive comfort, pleasure from us, you give unto us in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We also see great humility. Lord, and serv servanthood attitude from him. Lord, we see in the world, the people of the world, they call them ministers, although they still lord over the people. But we see our Savior that it's not so. And dear Father, if our Lord has done this, we look up unto you. We pray, dear Father, that as you have given us this opportunity once, Lord, we don't want to come to heaven and regret that we could have committed, I mean, given more sacrifice. We could have committed ourselves the more and could have done it this way, that way. Father, we don't want to come and regret. We pray, dear Father, you will really help us to be what you want us to be. And as our hearts are really... I'm so excited today because God has been so faithful to me. I'm going to keep this very short. First of all, I want to thank God for the church. The church has been my family. Um, thank you so much, Pastor Dada. He has been a father to me. I don't start crying. Okay, um, I remember I came here without um, scholarship to Howard University. The first year wasn't easy, but I got a grant that paid half of my tuition. But then from second year, I got like five different scholarships from my department. Thank you. 